YouTube is growing increasingly unstable. It seems like the platform is struggling to make ends meet, and short form content might be why. Take a look at this graph. At first glance, one might see this and think, $31 billion sure is a lot of money. But I'd like to point out something interesting. 2021 is the first year that YouTube revenue stopped seeing significant growth. And here, in March of 2021, is when the company made shorts available in the United States. Since then, the company has been desperately trying to increase profits through measures like banning ad blockers. If this public data isn't enough to worry you, then perhaps a statement from YouTube staff might. According to a Financial Times article, longtime employees are concerned that YouTube shorts are eating away at their bread and butter, long form content. While the company is still generating revenue, it appears that YouTube has hit its peak. And without knowing the costs associated, it's hard to determine their profit. That being said, the amount of layoffs at Alphabet, YouTube's parent company, imply that whatever they're making is not enough to satisfy the suits at the top. And I think that's why we're going to see a very interesting shift in the content world soon. If TikTok doesn't sell within the next nine months, then YouTube and Meta might just decide that short form content isn't worth the trouble, which is going to change a lot of things for creators who are already under intense pressure to outperform an algorithm, throw in some psychological torture from seven year olds and threats to their physical safety. And it's easy to see why there are so many retired YouTubers. It's akin to being an actor. Of course, the most successful come to mind, but we've recently learned with the strikes in media and through documentaries like Quiet On Set that some of our favorite actors have been undercompensated, underappreciated, and oftentimes abused. We've already seen a ton of devastating situations play out due to a lack of protections for creators on this platform, but these issues seem to occur in mainstream media spaces as well. So in a world where YouTubers and live streamers regularly get more views than TV programming, what really is the difference? A lot of people would argue that it's the quality, but we're at the point where many of the top channels on this website hold entire production teams behind the scenes and create content rivaling some of our favorite shows on TV. I'd argue that the distinguishing factor, outside of the platform's beginnings and community, is the length of most videos. While TV programming is relatively consistent, you can find content on YouTube as short as a dog barking and as long as that video essay about a niche topic you turned on and then forgot about. We've seen a lot of creators who we consider successful making a lot of strange decisions lately. And I'd like you to keep an open mind here because I'm going to share my opinion why they're acting this way and how it ties into the content change. I think it's very easy to dismiss creators like Hassan as greedy and problematic because nobody likes to hear someone better off complain. In the wise words of Conan, First of all, nobody in show business should complain. It's just rule number one. Don't you complain. sound like a whining. Uh, yeah, when you exactly. Make that kind and, of money, you know, but... we make crazy money and yeah. we're getting to live out our dreams and then you're complaining and anyone listening uh, is rightfully thinking you're a jackass. But there are a lot of factors in this changing landscape that might play a part into why so many creators that we used to enjoy seem to be unrelatable and out of touch lately. In college, I took a sports psychology class, and interestingly enough, there seem to be a lot of parallels between professional sports players and YouTubers. Hear me out. The first is that many football players are prepared to be stars from a young age. Their whole life becomes their job, and their parents often become their employers. For a lot of these kids, their sports talent is a ticket to the good life and a way to escape economic struggle. Except that when they do get to college football, they're often not compensated appropriately. Many times, they're barred from creating value off of their own personas, lured in with the promise of an education to guarantee their future. A lot of the time, they're put into ghost classes, where they learn nothing that would allow them to succeed in a traditional job, and they're often graded with such leniency that they could probably pass the class without ever attending. Even if they do make it to the NFL, they're not promised a long career. Many retire early due to severe injuries or are discarded once their first contract is up. To make matters worse, the impact of traumatic brain injuries and a lack of financial planning means that a lot of these professional players go broke. Instead of signing their kids up for private sports lessons, a lot of parents are opting to buy a camera and film their kids in hopes that they become the next Ryan's world. In a sense, I think we're seeing a gold rush type situation where a bunch of parents think they can just start filming their kids to sell supplement their income. And it's not hard to see where they got this idea of content creation being a great side hustle. There are a ton of content creators that were famously able to escape poverty because of their success on YouTube. 
Like Ghost classes, many YouTubers believe they're building up strong skills that are transferable to a full-time career and that they can easily pivot back into a traditional job afterwards. Unfortunately, marketing is extremely oversaturated, and the skills that YouTubers learn are useful, but they're just not able to be taken advantage of in most corporate positions because of time constraints. Hiring managers are looking for experience working in team settings as a subordinate, with tight deadlines and tools that, frankly, most YouTubers don't have experience with. There are also YouTubers who, as a result of their contracts, are basically barred from success once they've built up their own platform. A good example would be corporate VTubers. A lot of the times they don't own the rights to the characters that they create content with, meaning that if they ever decide to part from the company, they also have to say goodbye to that success. And the reasons they're let go are not always fair. Selen Tatsuki was a VTuber at the very popular company, Niji Sanji. If you're not familiar with the VTubing space, you might be surprised to hear that she built up a very large audience of almost 1 million followers on YouTube and many more across her other platforms. One would assume that a creator so large, at one of the most established companies for the space, would be making more than enough to support themselves. So, how would you react if I told you that not only did they not make a million dollars, but not even a thousand dollars, and that she even ended up losing money as a result of her time with the company? Not only that, but she was publicly humiliated and terminated as a result of a mental health crisis caused by the other talent at the agency itself. Luckily though, Selene's fans mostly came to support her, following the termination under her rebrand as Doki Bird. With her successfully building up her new channel to almost 700,000 followers on YouTube as of this recording. That being said, most creators aren't so lucky. I guess what I'm trying to say is, we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes, but it's fair to assume that some of our favorite creators might not have the cushy lives that we think they do. There have been a number of cases similar to Doki Birds in recent years, so please believe me when I say that entertainment is ripe for corruption. But despite these trials, many young people are jumping at the chance to join this world. Even still, we've seen many successful creators take a step back from content, many influencers are turning over their golden reins, and others are deciding to take a swing at creating their own small businesses. While many blame short-form content, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that the AdSense decrease from vertical video isn't everything but a big part. And that other part that's missing is better explained from the words of a much larger creator. I, I know I'm gonna fall off. Every MFR on the website's gonna fall off at some point, all right? Try to name five actors that were popular 100 years ago. You can't. And, and so I'm ready for that. And I think if you're not thinking about how this could be the last day that you will have the followers you have, the viewers you have, then I think you're you're too you're too cocky, you're too you're too comfortable in your own britches. Like a sports star, creators have no choice but to front load their income. Unless you're extremely egotistical, I think everyone knows that there will be a rise and eventually there will be a fall. Even big YouTubers like Simply Nailogical have gone years creating content alongside their full-time job out of fear that the gravy train would end as soon as they chose to put their content at the forefront of their lives. Jason Nash and Boogie are a great example of why creators do this. It's easy to assume that good things will last forever, but that blind confidence and overspending can eventually lead to devastating consequences. While editing this, I actually came across an interesting video that discusses why it seems like we're always hearing about celebrities and influencers going broke. I definitely recommend you watch it because it puts into perspective why YouTubers that seem to have it made keep ending up in financial distress when their channels start to stagnate. But more than the money, what reason does a passionate individual have to create on any platform? I've heard this a lot from successful people, but being creative is inherently embarrassing. You have to be a tiny bit unhinged to share in the way that a lot of people do to grow. And you have to spend a lot of years making stuff that nobody wants to watch, until you get good enough to make something that people do. Now we live in a world where there is no shortage of unhinged content. The rise of TikTok and vertical video did something super unique. Other formats are great, but what they don't do is allow you to completely detach. If a piece of content is going to be one second to a minute long, you don't necessarily need to form bonds with the creator the same way you would with a 40 minute vlog. So we don't. Our feeds get flooded with content that we otherwise wouldn't watch, like a story time video from a woman in Kansas who got cheated on that we've never seen before and will never see again. A Karen is recorded and we never question what came before, or a man named Caleb is dragged through the mud for his dating habits while thousands of messages pour into his employer asking him to be removed from his position. So yes, while we don't form bonds, we still put ourselves out there, whether consensually or not, and we will still face the consequences. 
Anytime you post on social media, you're contributing to a digital footprint that's going to follow you for the rest of your life. And while you might not go viral, there's always the risk of somebody taking issue with the stuff that you post. So why take that risk? Even before vertical content, the internet was known to do some sleuthing. But short-form content has fundamentally changed how we interact with these situations. Compared to forums where we seek out specific content, we're instead spoon-fed these events as they come around. And the platforms are designed to get you involved, not just by commenting, but maybe by making a video response. To avoid the drama, you could just swipe but then you won't be fed the resolution. You won't know if that woman ever broke up with her cheating boyfriend, and you'll be out of the loop if someone asks. I think Bo Burnham's song, Welcome to the Internet, perfectly encapsulates this concept of never-ending parasocial, antisocial attachment that we're all forming in recent years. And I think his interview content shows us that this influencer lifestyle isn't necessarily the life that everyone thinks it is. I know very little about anything, but what I do know is that if you can Live your life without an audience. You should do it. Now, more than ever, we're asked to give our opinion on everything. But with less than a minute to gauge the situation, how could we? But hey, at least the creators are making money, right? Right? It's no secret that vertical format video provides less income. Each video has a different RPM, or revenue per 1,000 qualified views. From snooping around, it seems that most creators start at the 10 cent to 50 cent range and have to work their way up. This number depends on a lot of factors, from engagement rate in the first few seconds to your niche or viewer's locations. But here's the kicker, that's on qualified views. Let's say your video gets 20 million views, but TikTok tells you, not so fast, bucko, those don't count for XYZ reasons. Now your qualified views is 3.7 mil, and you only get money off of those views. This means that instead of making $12,000 from a handful of viral videos, you end up making 2,000. And nowadays, since most channels aren't just one person editing in their garage, that money has to go towards editors, scriptwriters, researchers, and videographers leaving not much left over if the creator is adequately compensating their crew. It's also become more evident over the years that content creators are building on borrowed ground. And by that, I mean, it's insanely easy to have your account terminated. Unless you're a large creator, you're probably going to be back to square one. Many creators also run into difficulties come April. It's not unheard of for creators to be unknowingly taxed on items that they received as PR, or to end up owing large sums of money because their accountant or team made a mistake withholding too little in taxes. But it's it's not just creators feeling the pain from low AdSense, the platforms are feeling it as well. Shorts just don't generate the revenue needed to rationalize the server space and payouts. Meta has completely removed any form of compensation for Reels starting in March of 2023, and TikTok itself has tried and tried again to implement longer form content as well as deleting its creator fund in December of 2023 in lieu of the Creator Rewards program which has a much higher barrier to entry. In a perfect world, creators would say fuck it to short form and just make a seamless transition into long form by swapping to YouTube. And that's what a lot of creators nowadays seem to be attempting. But this is not a perfect world. It's not so easy to transfer followers to a new platform. Not only that, but many people like to say that shorts viewers and long form content viewers are fundamentally different audiences. However, I think that's pretty short sighted. When TikTok goes poof, and YouTube and Instagram realize they don't have to compete with all these cumbersome short-form videos not producing the income they need to cover the costs, it'll be axed. And then where will the TikTok viewers go? Long-form content. I can almost tell when someone leaves a comment on my video if they come from a traditional YouTube background. For a long time, I think there's been a general understanding on YouTube that a 12 minute video is not going to cover the entire intricacies of any situation back to the 1500s, unlike that seven hour video essay that you watched on your second monitor. Recently, I made a video about Freerun. In that video, I mentioned how it had passed FMA, but I neglected to mention that the show was one of my favorites. I really didn't think that was necessary information, and I knew that if I went on a tangent, people would probably click away. Not surprisingly, people left comments complaining that I wasn't giving it a fair shot, and was inappropriately dismissing it as a bad show. But I never said I disliked the show. In a similar way, whenever I'm forced to make a short form video, I notice that in order to succeed, I can't go into detail the way I would in a long video. People don't care about the details. They want to be entertained, not educated. They don't want to know who I am, and they definitely don't care. 
The videos where I have chosen to go into greater detail more than a sentence or two end up getting buried, but the viral video is ripe with misinformation throughout the comments that I can't address because nobody will see the follow-up video. So creators are put in this weird position where they can either create a video that is not in-depth but fast-paced and entertaining and try to link it to a longer video, or they can create a video that is in-depth that'll receive almost no views. No one is digging for information in 2024. What you present is what you will get. And as such, people are getting used to making assumptions about what little information they're provided. Now, I don't blame people for assuming that a content creator is a bad person. The space is ripe with scammers and criminals, like I said earlier. That being said, I don't consider the influencers peddling African sponge nets and sea moss criminal. What I instead see are creators doing everything they can to take their passion full time so they can quit their draining 9 to 5s, or trying to make just a little bit more income this month to pay rent. Heck, I even knew someone with 3 million followers who worked at Target. Don't get it twisted, I'm not here to be an apologist for creators like Haley Bailey. But I do think viewers need to critically think about the channels and the content that they consume. Because if you do want quality content, then you're going to have to support the creators you follow. When most viewers are reluctant to even subscribe to channels they watch frequently, we shouldn't be surprised when those channels disappear. So, if the platforms won't pay a living wage, and the community is generally reluctant to support creators out of pocket, then what choice do creators have but to create other avenues via sponsorships and small businesses? And more importantly, if you are a creator whose core desire to create comes from a passion of sharing things that you love, is creating content still comparable when you have to make it sterile to be seen? I'd argue not. I think this is why we'll see a lot of older creators leaving, and a shortage of new, passionate creators growing big enough and staying big enough to become relevant. Because if money isn't an incentive, then passion to create has to be. Short-form content isn't rewarding in the same way that long-form content is, because people generally tend to leave comments similar to the first 5 or 10. It's become way more difficult to sustain the valuable interaction and community-building aspect that was pretty much guaranteed with content in the past. Long-form content takes a lot of time to produce, and if you're creating for fun, then you're not expected to sustain yourself off of it. But you do expect benefits in the form of people enjoying what you create. And let's face it, Unless someone is really moved by your content or hates it, you usually aren't going to hear from them. Viewer, I want to ask you one question. Under all of these conditions and all of these factors, would you create? If you said no, that's fair. But for every no, I guarantee there is someone out there willing to say yes. Similar to the early days of YouTube where we had no idea if tomorrow would be the day that they pulled the plug, where there was absolutely no monetary incentive. We're in a situation where creators are going to be competing against thousands of auto-generated videos, and even when shouting into the void, I think artists will continue to create. AI and short-form content might bring a death to the platforms that we know and love, but like a phoenix, I think it'll rise again. We'll be born into a new era of creation. I hope to see you there. If you like this video, give a slothy smash to that share button. Or if you're feeling particularly generous, you can check out my small business, Psycho Stationery. Thanks for watching.